Hello and welcome to another episode of the Startup Operator Roundup. I'm Roshan Karipa. And I'm Gunjan Saha. And together we break down the biggest headlines of India's growing startup ecosystem. If this is the first time you're tuning into the channel, please consider subscribing to it for we have some fantastic conversations with founders, investors and operators. And if you're a regular listener, you know what to do. Like, share, do all the good stuff so that more people like you can discover our content. This week, we have some exciting updates from e-commerce, government, as well as the startup ecosystem. The Great India Shopping Festival is on. Amazon, Flipkart, Misho, they're all fighting to, you know, get access to your wallet so that you spend money on their platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, Men's XP, which was acquired by uh, Mensa Brands two years back, they're now discussing on how to part ways. So some breakup story is brewing there. Wow. And then GoQuick has acquired Return Prime for an undisclosed amount. And this also signals GoQuick's expansion into the international markets. The center has also been busy. They launched an AI-powered trademark search module. So talk about the government adopting AI. And the government has also simplified approvals for overseas startups that want to shift domicile back to India. Some uh, laws have been streamlined, which will be making it easy for them. The government also announced plans to have its very own self-sustained space station uh, by 2035. Wow. And then there's some exciting program launched by Axel as well called Axel Atoms for early stage founders, as well as some exciting updates and Twitter threads coming up. So stay tuned as we dive deeper into these topics. Hey, Roshan, nice festive shirt. Thanks, man. I mean, huh? uh, I don't know if you guys can see it. We got rid of the table. So you can see more of uh, Gunjan Saha. <laughs> <laughs> for, for all Gunjan Saha fans, a treat yeah. for the eyes. And I guess. Ears. <laughs> <laughs> what have you been up to? We are doing this roundup after two weeks. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, so we're thinking of making this a fortnightly. There's just a lot more topics to discuss. And of course, I mean, you don't have to see us every week, right? <laughs> right. But uh, it's been a busy time overall. I think uh, Prime Minister Modi is in the US uh, for the Quad meetings, um, meeting with uh, President Biden. Um, <laughs> it's still Biden, not Trump. <laughs> although I don't know if President Biden himself knows, right? Uh, there were a few of these videos circulating where he's clearly like, you know, Disoriented, which is kind of sad to see to actually. I'm a lit. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Man, Anuman kind. He's huh? killing it. He's absolutely, absolutely killing, killing it. it. One of the one of my favorite things to do over the last two, three weeks has been to just watch these reaction videos, <laughs> right? Of these hardcore rap fans yeah. just completely lose it, you know. Uh amazing, amazing. I think yeah. he's reviving the interest in hip hop in India for sure, right? So Good stuff. And uh, Coldplay is visiting, by the way. Dude, Coldplay is visiting. Dua Lipa is visiting. Green Day is yeah. visiting. Like, the list just goes on. I think it's going to be a great... Yeah, India, India is going to become a concert destination for yeah. a lot of these international acts. And that's awesome. Um, I mean, there was there was a stretch, I think, from 2005-ish, 4-ish to around uh, uh, 8 or 9, if I remember correctly, where you had all of these acts, right? Brian Adams and uh, Deep Purple and Metallica and so on and so forth. Mm. Uh, play at Bangalore. I'm really looking forward to something like that happening, perhaps 10x more. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting time. I watched uh, IC814, the okay. series on Netflix, which has been <laughs> in the news, uh, right? And uh, it made me really angry, man, for some reason. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, made what me was really, your really take angry. on it? Like, how far was it from reality? Look, I mean, it's not a documentary for sure, right? I mean, uh, uh, so you see these bit of artistic flourishes Right, like the terrorist uh, speaks, you know, <laughs> the Queen's English, you know, perfectly uh, oh. well. Uh, and he says like profound lines like, you know, I I'm glad death is a privilege for you guys still. Um, <laughs> right. And worse, I mean, the one of the air hostesses, right, in, in all of this, you know, mm. shit going down, she has, she thinks he's cute. Yeah, Stockholm Syndrome, classic yeah, case. I mean, <laughs> insane, insane, right. And, and every Indian official they show, almost mm. every one of them is... Uh, Super incompetent and almost corrupt, right? And mm. if you exclude perhaps Arvinda Swami, everyone's like fat and stupid, right? Pretty much. <laughs> but so is that is that the portrayal of India from from that period? I mean, I mean, I'm sure there's a huge see. Star it's a skew, right? It's a, it's definitely a skew. Uh, and these are you know the artistic flourishes that you know the makers have chosen to sort of put in there, right? Mm. You don't have to show the guy speaking fluent English. You don't have to justify what he's doing, mm. right? Uh, and, and you know, I mean, 
that time man it was just such a crazy time for india um, you know I, i when this happened i was returning from an ncc camp um i was in eighth standard or something and remember reading the headlines and it was such a surreal feeling you know so 99 this happened and this was just after kargil had happened hmm. right um and then you had uh, uh, what is that the parliament attack masterminded by masood azhar who the uh, one who, who was released, released yeah. yeah um right so that happened and then we had the akshardham uh, temple attack right multiple countless uh, train bombings and so on and so forth in that period right uh and of course culminating with uh, 2611 and then what do we do in 2010 we start aman ki aasha right <laughs> i mean sometimes so I since then, it's since just then like india has started taking a very like, no of course a strong stance against the terrorism see post 2014 that's the single biggest thing that's changed right i mean again not to go on like this uh, weird tangent here but uh, you guys should definitely read some of rvs money's uh, work he was a cabinet secretary at that time and he talks about all of the terror attacks that used to happen it was fairly regular hmm. and i'm not talking about in places like punjab or kashmir i'm talking about bangalore uh, i remember the isc uh, shootings right hmm. uh, pune the german bakery case so on right um so yeah i mean it was uh, national security was uh, down in the dumps uh, literally you know so since then i mean we've come a long way and i really hope that maybe someday there's peace but i hope that peace is negotiated on our our terms you know so hmm. yeah sorry for that uh, you know longish tangent on uh, that front okay but, no there's yeah. another topic i think we should definitely talk yeah. about right which was the ei sui- ey suicide case yeah. right it was very disheartening to see uh, anna sebastian's terrible. Uh, death absolutely terrible and her mother also wrote a very uh, a Point very piece. Uh, yeah. honest letter to the chairman of ey who according to recent reports has clearly denied the work pressure claims in the company yeah i mean it was uh, very uh, i won't say poorly worded but i mean it could have been done better right i mean i saw the ey heads uh, uh, letter and the internal email that circulated saying that it's only been 4 months since uh, she joined here and and so on right uh, I, i mean this is an open secret right i mean i'm sure that you guys have friends or family who have worked in the big four and work hours are absolutely terrible you know hmm. absolutely terrible 14 to 16 hour you know days on the regular um, right and it's a very competitive industry you know uh, the big four especially they're always vying for each other's accounts it's a damn competitive industry uh, and there's little to no uh, you know uh, differentiation between uh, each of these folks right hmm. uh, so so it's not uncommon for a large firm to work with uh, you know one or more of these uh, folks during a, a set period of time right so so it's a lot of uh, a lot of customer service a lot of like going above and beyond what is required and so on right but also i mean i think it's a lot of inefficiency on the the reporting managers um and and the level above that right because i always believe that sure culture is top down but if you are the kind of person who wants to make work uh, you know fun and productive for people you can right in any place in absolutely any place and uh, you know the managers have to take a little more responsibility i feel right i mean um, yeah it, it's weird i don't know how people opt into this uh, kind of work and lifestyle you know it, it it's it's sad but also i mean you have rarely any any choice at that stage right i mean you've just finished your chartered accountancy and then you know you've had to do this for your article ship uh, right and, and the big four is seen as the most viable option for all of these folks um so yeah it is it's pretty sad really sad i did see uh, mr shashi tharoor uh, uh, the mp suggest that he is going to fix work hours and so on and so forth and i have also seen a tweet of uh, you know um, uh, who's that rahul gandhi as well going and meeting the family look i mean the politicians are going to use it for their own uh, mm-hmm. you know uh, purposes for sure right and it's it's not going to get solved by mandating a fixed hour shift right it's not going to get uh, solved by um, you know uh, insisting on compensation and so on and so forth right um, that's not the way to solve this um, i think I, i won't say that you have to leave it to the market obviously not right but there are basic labor laws in place i mean there are basic labor laws in place that have to be enforced what we don't need is more laws and more regulation right, right. for sure because as unfortunate as this incident is uh, 
we do also have to bear in mind that uh, you know this is a specific case right uh, and whatever you do right now can have a broader uh, sort of an impact on the entire uh, ecosystem as such mm -hmm. um so i i really hope though that uh, the people responsible for this are held accountable you know mm -hmm. i hope they don't like you know escape with these uh, uh, nice carefully crafted pr uh, releases and what not um, yeah and yeah. it's a it's a call for introspection for all of us really i mean even at startups right i mean there's this whole swag value of oh you know what i stayed up all night for that release and what not uh, i always say that look i mean that has to be sinusoidal right you can do that meaningfully maybe like a few times a month yeah. right or maybe once a week if required right if there's a massive release coming up if there's some you know crazy event that is coming up sure stay up all night and uh, it's good to have that all hands on deck feeling uh, and do that but if you're doing it every day then there's something severely it wrong can't with your process the standard operating procedure no, then, then there's any, something any wrong point. then there's absolutely something wrong with the way you're operating uh, right and it's not always about hiring more people it's maybe about fixing your processes yeah Mm. Yeah. Cool. So you mentioned about, you know, maybe once a week maybe stay up late and finish up work and stuff. That's mm. not a prescription, but yeah. <laughs> no, but I mean, I'm sure all folks in the e-commerce industry will be doing that, the big billion Amazon Prime Day. Nice <laughs> segue. <laughs> so yeah, most e-commerce uh, folks working in the e-commerce industry will be having long nights and long days. Uh Amazon, Flipkart, Meesho, they're all gearing up. for the annual festival sales and this not only means you know more money coming into the platform but also internally they need to reorganize themselves from a data infrastructure standpoint server standpoint payment capabilities and logistics yeah. so there's a whole mammoth of orchestration that goes on behind the scenes and we have had folks from flipkart from misho talk about this in our podcast yeah uh, so can you just take us through what all goes on over there so this is uh, the annual festive season right and obviously people have to ramp up on capacity uh, because literally everyone you mentioned is vying for the consumer's business uh, and and there's a fixed pool of money that uh, they can mm -hmm. all uh, you know vie for right so uh, it's amazing and and it's also amazing to see how this is such an impact for you know the the second order folks yeah, as well yeah. right i mean your lending institutions for example uh, and your so on your last I mean, mile delivery lending institutions yeah, yeah they they were kind of uh, they they've also come into the entire uh, you know uh, foray and they're also promoting a bunch of stuff so this is awesome man i mean uh, i remember 10 or 12 years back when this whole great indian festival thing started i mean it was or big billion day as billion. Uh, flipkart. flipkart used to call it and it was such a thrill uh, you know uh, with the newspaper ads we hadn't seen anything of that sort yeah. uh, before right i mean obviously we saw like your neighborhood electronic store kind of <laughs> advertising and so on but not on this kind of scale yeah. uh, all the best to everyone who's uh, making this possible all of the engineers who are kind of staying up to you know <laughs> support war room all situations of this. happening yeah a lot of war room situations yeah. um you know i know a couple of folks who are like extremely strapped as well so all the best to all of you guys mm -hmm. i hope you guys do well and uh, post this season i hope you guys take a breather as well yeah. and also meet us give us a party yeah why not how about some discount code <laughs> yeah please? exactly that's the minimum that can be done <laughs> but anyway amazon to like deal with this um the festive season they're launching an ai powered chatbot as well mm. to help customers discover products create curated lists and also help with servicing but one point which i think is really beneficial for india as a country is the amount of new jobs that these festival seasons bring in yeah, and absolutely. the government is also taking proactive measures to make sure their welfare is looked after yeah. uh, i think they are they've sent circulars to all the e-commerce companies asking them to register all gig workers on the shram platform which is a central repository again yeah so a lot of exciting updates coming from there yeah people always diss on indian weddings and festivals right saying that it's just wasteful expense hmm. but uh, <laughs> they don't acknowledge how much uh, second order third order effects it has on the economy right i hmm. mean literally the number of people being employed the amount of money coming into the ecosystem and so on right i mean you'd rather wish that than you know people just like um, hoard cash or gold or whatever right so yeah Okay, let's talk about men's XP. I think uh, during the whole lockdown phase, isn't men's XP or men's sexy? <laughs> Are you talking about yourself? Hey, hey. 
Okay, a couple of years back in in one of the round of episodes, we were talking about uh, Thrasio and Mensa, right? How Mensa is replicating the Thrasio model of roll up e commerce, and that could have a big viability in India as well. One of the brands that um, Mensa had acquired was Mens XP, but now the company is in talks for a separation, mm. right? This is so that Mens XP can adapt more freely to market dynamics, have more control over their operations, and attract new partnerships uh, for their business. But this is also not the first time we are seeing, you know, an acquired company talking to the parent company for a separation. This has happened in the past. Mm. We had Paytm Mall in 2020 that separated from Paytm. Geo is another great example. The Geo platform completely became independent from Reliance Industries, and we also CureFit that separated. Um, I think from Cult, mm. right? They, they, there was a shoot off from there. So why exactly is this? Is this, is this signaling it was a failed acquisition or is this just like how companies evolve? Oh, I, uh, well, I don't know the details of this uh, to be able to say one thing or the other about the acquisition, uh, right? But although I do, I do acknowledge that, you know, some of these brands and everything were acquired uh, during the peak of peak times, yeah. right? So I don't know how much of those, uh, you know, deals and whatnot have, uh, mm. you know, fared the way they were supposed so to. What right? is the so, role of these roll-up commerce brands? See, they roll up companies? Is, yeah, roll-up is simple, right? I mean, roll-up is you you build a horizontal layer of all of these functions like HR, operations, finance, legal, hmm. uh, even growth perhaps, right? Uh, and basically, you leverage this horizontal functions for these individual entities. So if you're a small, you know, smallish D2C brand, etc., you join this uh, uh, roll-up and you, you get instant value from all of these uh, you know, very mature functions that are already working with other entities like yourself, right? Mm. But the the thing is, I mean, when you get to a men's XP, men's XC <laughs> scale, <laughs> right? Maybe you want to do better, right? Maybe, maybe all of these things that were offhand available are limiting factors for you, right? Maybe you want to do way more than that, right? Mm. So, so which is why, I mean, uh, typically you see some of these folks spin off, um, right? And um, this is just a par for the course, usually. So it's just a like way of growth. Yeah. Next uh, steps. I mean, I'm sure that they would have discussed and debated this stuff, you know, on the pros and cons of, you know, what it'll take to operate ind independently mm -hmm. uh, versus, you know, being part of that umbrella set of brands. Right. And uh, they somehow see value more in, uh, you know, operating independently at this point. Yeah. Okay. So we've also exciting news coming from Go Quick, which is, you know, one of India's more well-known e-commerce enablers. They recently acquired this company called Return Prime, which is a Shopify company. Uh, it manages global returns that operate within the Shopify ecosystem. This acquisition is allowing GoQuick to expand its international markets and foray into UK, Europe, and US. According to some reports, this acquisition will help GoQuick onboard more than 10,000 new merchants in the next 6 to 12 months period. And this is projected to result in a 3x increase in their overall business by the end of this year. Mm. Now, India is undoubtedly one of the top e-commerce destinations in the world, right? I think only second next to China for Alibaba. But there was something which Flipkart, which is one of the OG e-commerce brands, they really solved for an Indian problem was cash on delivery. Mm. That was not there in US or European markets. But now uh, with this acquisition, GoQuick can take this practice to the global markets and see how it works over there. It's not very profitable. So I don't know if uh, you want to take cash on delivery to all of those markets. But look, I mean, GoQuick is a category creator, right? Uh, in that sense. Uh, they've been focused on this conversion optimization for mm -hmm. e-commerce uh, for a while now, uh, right? It's not easy being the uh, first or second or early in a category, for sure. There's a lot of uh, uh, evangelization of not just the solution, but also of the problem statement uh, that you have to do. Uh, so kudos to them. We had Chirag on the podcast maybe a couple of years back and he spoke uh, passionately about his journey as well. He was in Bombay Shaving Company, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly, uh, and saw these problems firsthand uh, and what happens at scale, right? Return to order, for example, is a very, is a, is a key thing, which is that, uh, you know, there's a lot of cost in processing these returns, right? Can you, e can you even reduce these by a few basis points? Right? Um, can you reduce them uh, to a degree that you know you're you're saving so much on the bottom line? Right? Mm. Um, so, Go Quick has three or four products, if I remember correctly, uh, around these lines. Right? That can help e-commerce businesses 
almost build like an Amazon style or a Flipkart style uh, operating uh, practice. And also right? very end to end, right? I mean, end to end uh, of of this sort, um, which is uh, which is amazing, right? I mean, we saw this whole uh, non Amazon, non uh, uh, Shopify even kind of a wave take shape over the last like mm -hmm. three years. Uh, where a bunch of these folks are, you know, helping uh, small businesses set up their own shop, end-to-end uh, -end, uh, tech and automation, mm -hmm. uh, simple marketing things like you reaching out to your users, so yeah. on and so forth. Um, and there's enough of this tech and automation. There's enough of a stack right now to build a weekend to to build a um, a store and a business over a weekend, right? Yeah. That's how much this infrastructure has evolved from payments to logistics to you know marketing to everything. So, so this is awesome. I mean, I, I think uh, Go Quick is perhaps doing about 25 million in revenue at this point, um, and uh, this is a part cash, part part equity sort of a, a deal. Okay, the details of the deal are yeah. not yet made public. So, yeah. so the good thing is they get to uh, you know access all of these other markets yeah. that uh, uh, the company is in. Uh, return to prime, return prime, Re uh, return prime. Yeah, they're return operating prime. in yeah. Europe, US. I keep saying return to prime. <laughs> With subtle Amazon plug. <laughs> yeah. So uh, they get to access all of those uh, markets and they also like layer a different product, right? So uh, it's good. I mean, the, the category itself is growing uh, by a fair bit, uh, by 30% CAGR is what Chirag says, right? And uh, they are very well positioned to capture mm -hmm. most of the value in this uh, market. Yeah. Now, one thing, interesting evolution, not in, like evolution, but rather interesting competition, which is seeing in e-commerce spaces, e-commerce versus Q-commerce. Mm. Right, uh, the mm. Blinkets and the Zeptos and the Instamarts are now fighting for the same market. Yeah. Earlier, it was quite differentiated. Right, e-commerce is going to be for your electronics and yeah. whatever. I mean, I was uh, pleasantly shocked that our producer ordered some, you know, cable from Blinket uh, yesterday. <laughs> 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 I mean, you forget cables. You can order PS fives, iPhones, and yeah. whatnot on Blinket and Zepto. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I think the, it's that it's a period of transition, right? I mean, uh, you mentioned Zepto Cafe, I think, you know, a few weeks back mm, or whatever, yeah. right? So so there's an overlap with the Zomato Swiggies. Then there is an overlap clearly with the flip cards of the world and right. so on, right? My hypothesis is everything that can be delivered in 10 minutes will be delivered in 10 minutes. Mm. Right? So what cannot be delivered in 10 minutes? Uh, well, I mean, I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, I don't think the the heavy bag that I ordered can be delivered <laughs> in ten minutes. <laughs> you you can much less get it out of the you know warehouse in ten minutes. I think so. So yeah, they will. They but e-commerce stuff will will be relegated to some of these niche things. I think hmm. right. Like I don't think an air conditioner <laughs> will be delivered okay, in yeah, ten minutes, fair, or okay. somebody will want it in ten minutes. Hmm. Yeah, but it's so. interesting, right? Like as a consumer, also behaviors are changing. So now I don't want to wait. Yeah. For a Cheaper, faster, better, man. I mean, yeah. it's like Bezos said, right? I mean, invest in the things that are going to be that that are going to be unchanging forever and forever. Nobody will ever say that I want things that are a little costlier, hmm. a little difficult to use, and a little slower, right? Yeah. So, which means that cheaper, faster, better, forever and forever will be the the best unique value proposition for a product for sure. Nice, good, good insight. Yeah, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Okay, moving on to the next topic. This uh, comes to a close for what we are seeing in the e-commerce space. Now let's talk about some initiatives the center is taking up. Last week, the center launched an AI-powered trademark search module, which uses AI and ML to enhance the accuracy in which you can search a trademark database. Now this is very important as the government is also pushing companies and innovators to file for more patents. Trademark searches in India are lengthy and error prone. And previously it was done manually, right? Which was a lot of time taken, a lot of effort, money, yeah. resources spent. But now imagine having a platform where you can just go and do a quick search and that will give you an entire list of things. What is similar, how much is overlap and what should you be doing next? Yeah, so uh, I've had this experience. I had to trademark a couple of brands. By the way, do you know the startup operator is trademarked? Of course I know. TM. Hey. Now you guys know, right? <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, less, uh, less than optimal experience, right? Uh, mm. First to kind of like figure out what word or phrase uh, is unique enough, right? And you go back and forth on that mm. front. Then there are these various categories, whether it's education, entertainment, so on and so forth that you have to apply for. Mm. Um, again, quite ambiguous, right? 
and you apply for these two or three categories and then you get a sort of a notice saying that no i mean it's rejected for this and and, and typical like court language right typical legalese you, you, you get you get this I line that you have that. <laughs> you have no understanding like what that means this right? read read with clause this no i mean you I have no know. idea right what that means uh, and so you go back and forth and back and forth and the only people who really benefit from this is the is the middleman right and i went through an online portal itself right uh, dash search.com right <laughs> i mean that i don't want to dunk on them but yeah uh i went through these uh, folks and uh, these are supposed to be like the 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 more uh, latest friendly. and customer friendly stuff right and god alone knows you know what someone will do in the paper paper and pen world really you know so so went through these folks and it took me a good amount of time you know startup operator took me i think maybe a year really yeah i mean back and forth on email right uh, saying this is rejected that is rejected whatever um and then bharatwarta took me maybe couple of years and i think one of the cases is still ongoing like one of the petitions is still ongoing on that right and i just gave up so this is a very very tedious process for sure uh right i really really hope that uh, this new ai automation stuff that we do um while simplifying the name search that itself is a big deal yeah. uh, it's the start of the journey i mean it simplifies these other processes also that uh, you know we're able to apply for um ip trademark all of that stuff it's it's super important i think this whole legal space right i think is just waiting for ai to come and disrupt for sure. everything i think it's the first that will get disrupted yeah. for sure because you can already you can already argue that chat gpt perhaps functions like a decent associate like yeah. a law firm associate or even for customer yeah. facing side customer facing side yeah. as well right yeah. just put some stuff on chat gpt and you'll get exact in layman terms okay what is this yeah. agreement yeah. or what is this policy about for sure i i think it's ripe for disruption a lot of this like business process stuff right will will just be disrupted mm. that's the first thing that will be disrupted yeah. i feel i mean the days of it summarizing something yeah. or it's gonna see it's a bounded thinking. problem right when you talk about laws and you know policy and framework and stuff it's a bounded problem right you're mm. not using your imagination so much or even if you are i mean like let's say the interpretation and everything is is the margin at the margin the 80% of the stuff is like plain crunching right processing right. stuff i think it's it's going to be automated away for sure yeah. let's see if, if you guys are, if anyone of you is building in the legal tech using ai and what not yeah. do reach out to us we'll love to uh, you know host a conversation next up uh, the indian government has also simplified processes for overseas startups that are looking to merge with their indian arms the recent policy change by the indian government mandates that both foreign and indian companies must obtain prior approval from the reserve bank of india for any merger or amalgamation this is to facilitate smoother cross border transactions and enhance compliance over the last 2 3 years we have been seeing a lot of companies you know a singapore based or us based want to move the domicile mm. back to india otherwise it was a trend right yeah. even though your product r and d marketing team is sitting out of india you will be either a sf headquarter or a singapore headquarter startup yeah and a lot of companies are wanting to move back uh, grow has already completed a transition back to india from us in march 2024 PhonePay has relocated domicile from Singapore to India. We have Pine Labs, Misho, Razorpay, Zepto, Udan, and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. The next three four years in the Indian public markets, the the tech public market, I think it's going to be a really exciting space to watch. I think that is really the forcing function for this, which is the fact that the IPO market in India has kind of opened up. Right, startups are all looking to sort of list in the next, you know, one and a half two year time frame. right and uh, easing the regulation to sort of absorb some of these foreign entities right mm-hmm. uh, let's say a singapore or a delaware listed sort of entity uh, will will make it a lot more easier for these folks i think that has been the forcing function um it's good it's uh, you know it was the norm about 10 or 15 years back that uh, not even 10 years back i mean i would say even like 7 8 years back that if you wanted to raise like uh, external capital Uh, you were always advised to sort of like either have a singapore entity or like a delaware entity um in the us right, right? so um, it, it's good we're gl- i'm glad that we're seeing this switch and i'm also glad that 
you know indian vc funds itself have enough cash right now to support some of these like yeah. let's say growth rounds and so on right i mean everyone sitting on a lot of dry powder mm-hmm. so yeah. but let's go back like let's try to understand like why were companies wanting to shift to us or singapore right one of course was the tax benefits yeah. for the vcs and the second thing was also that people were more op- like ready to invest ready to pump in more money but for you to attract that kind of capital for for a start you have to have at least like what 30 million 40 million in arr some large profit margins and what not and if you compare that to india well one india definitely has the money as we have seen in the past few years but also the requirements for you to list in the country for people to invest in you is also much lower you don't need 40 million 100 million dollars in revenue to go public even with 15 20 million dollars okay you're ready to go public no you don't need that even in the us right i think there's some basic minimum criteria and and every market has this uh, sort of a I mean, you can list at a at a different uh, scale as well, right? You don't have to list list alongside Amazon or like you know, your HUL or something like that. You don't have mm-hmm. to, right? Uh, so so yeah, you are going to see a lot of companies go public sooner. That is uh, something that I will hazard a guess and say that, right? So um, uh, this is something that I think the Bloom folks have also been mm-hmm. uh, pioneering, right? In fact, um, our last roundup also we spoke about you know. uh 20 30 companies that will probably might go ipo in the next 18 20 yeah years. i think it'll drive greater discipline in terms of business building right um uh yeah i mean it, it's overall a positive i think yeah. yeah okay we have some exciting news coming from the space community in india india is set to establish its very own self sustained space station it will be called bhartiya antariksh station by 2035 the first module is expected to launch by 2028 This space station will accommodate around three to four astronauts with a maximum capacity of six for short durations. ISRO is currently developing the necessary technologies and design specifications for the station. Now, one of the main benefits of this is not just having a space station in space, but the kind of technology we'll be building to achieve this, the kind yeah. of processes and the regulations that will be set, that is going to have a massive, massive benefit for the space tech ecosystem in yeah. India. Yeah, it's it's something you can't sit out of, right? Uh, and we've already made so much of uh, headway in the space. I, I've often said on the podcast, the next five ten years, we're going to become like an industrial space superpower, so right. to speak, right? I mean, we're going to pioneer this industry of commercial space travel and um, research and so on and so forth, right? Uh, and there are a lot of uh not just technological but also geopolitical tailwinds that favor us right mm. uh given how uh, this sort of a multipolarity is emerging with uh, you know india sort of being the third front of uh, sorts right uh, so yeah i mean this is this is a fantastic fantastic development you know in the 60s uh, in the us uh, uh john f kennedy gave that clarion call to land a man on the moon and uh, that country progressed by leaps and bounds mm. right uh and we have a similar sort of an opportunity right now you know we have said that we're going to uh, have a man on the moon by 2040 uh, which is a really ambitious kind of a aim right and by 2035 we're going to have a space station as well uh, right now of course i mean there's the international space station and then the chinese have a space station hmm. there the as well the international space station is undergoing its own problems right now they're going to i i think it's going to be destroyed soon or something yeah it's no i'm l- i'm referring to the fulfill its uh, utility I'm referring to the uh, entire the Boeing aircraft that the Boeing space shuttle that went up that could not dock successfully mm-hmm. because of which two or three astronauts are stuck till uh, at least for the next eight months. Now. Wow, really? They are they were supposed to go for a four day five day trip, but imagine getting stuck for like eight months. Good God! So now SpaceX has come to the rescue. It's like okay, we will send our space shuttle up. Have you seen that movie Gravity? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, oh. <laughs> <laughs> with Sa- Sandra Bullock. Sandra Bullock and uh, George Clooney. George Clooney, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Brilliant movie. Yeah, brilliant movie and all, but yeah, he I kind remember, of kind of just floats away yeah. in space like that, right? I remember just, I was in class nine or ten when this movie released in Dehradun, and our school principal had gone to watch the movie. She liked it so much, she arranged the entire movie all be reserved just for our school. And that was like a good experience. Damn, where do you go to school, <laughs> dude? Like Rockford or something? <laughs> Yeah, oh, we yeah. went to see uh, Jurassic Park. <laughs> I mean, that's how old I am. So, <laughs> but uh, it's just uh, it, it's it's a phenomenal technological feat for sure, right? Mm-hmm. And it will uh, make sure that a lot of our, you know, 
uh levers are in place to sort of mm. a, in, in order for us to achieve that right because when you sort of backward engineer from that 2040 mission right there are a lot of things that have to come in come in yeah. place to enable that right um so, so and that yeah. will trickle down eh? that will trickle down into yeah. defense and consumer a lot tech of things, communications lot of things. and what not yeah for sure for sure uh defense you mentioned hmm. see i i think the the next level of defense i think would be like space wars right i mean you're going to do something uh, with the satellites and what not with space and speaking AI. of space and speaking AI. of did you guys watch the 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 stuff that's happening in uh, you know lebanon with the pagers going oh, off and yeah. holy <laughs> shit dude i mean like dude that was like, if you if you were to Israel ask me can pull pull off something like that if you ask me like the top 5 nightmares ever i think the <laughs> phone exploding the pocket would be like yeah. one of those right i mean so, walkie talkies and pagers like exploding in the pockets and like yeah. such a targeted yeah like you talk about surgical strikes right mm-hmm. just imagine like how wild you need to be in your thinking to devise a plan like this and actually execute dude it. think about it okay you have to infiltrate supply chains right you have mm-hmm. to actually get this in their hands right and you also have to figure a way to sort of like the technology stuff yeah. right i mean how are you going to like heat up a battery that it explodes <laughs> in someone's pocket I mean holy shit you know one theory i was reading up about all of this right before this pages were like distributed pages and walkie talkies were distributed they were stored in beirut mm. in the same warehouse where the explosion took place so explosion happened as a masking for you know distributing all of these things something like that i came across a theory on reddit so don't quote Dude, me the, anywhere the capabilities are actually like really scary really really scary and apparently there's a <laughs> Yeah apparently there's a malu dude who's involved in this whole <laughs> thing <laughs> big dog there's a yeah there's there's a i mean i can quite picture that right i mean like that dude just he's he's somewhere in so so this this uh, equipment was purchased from a norwegian shell company <laughs> this guy works there Mal- malu guy malu guy right and apparently iran has iran or someone has requested the kerala government to take action <laughs> wow <laughs> this is wild <laughs> good god anyway i mean but the point is the technology right <laughs> the technology is yeah. just insane man i mean this is perhaps the most targeted striking of terrorists ever or anyone ever right i mean it's just pretty insane I this don't is know something what... you see in movies like iron yeah. man or something right god alone knows what lies ahead we actually. are living in the future yeah In, in it's uh, like that quote right the future is already here it's just not evenly distributed damn <laughs> moving on axel has launched a new pre-seed accelerator program called axel atoms this is focused on supporting early stage startups in india to provide guidance and mentorship at the pre-seed stage which still includes startups in the idea phase the program aims to help founders navigate their journey from concept to market it'll be offering a 1 million dollar uh check size for selected startups either through equity or convertible notes along with access to over 5 million dollars in perks from partners like AWS and Google the cohorts they'll be focusing on specifically are the bharat startups that target middle income households in tier 2 tier 3 and rural india and they'll also be leveraging ai to build their products so it's a interesting push that yeah. coming from the vcs to develop for that market as you already know the yeah. affluent class of indians eh, those 10 million people they are already like saturated in terms of their tech adoption how much more consumer goods they could want the major growth driver is going to come from tier 2 tier 3 india and the and the rural side yeah no fantastic initiative by axel for sure and they've been running this program pretty successfully for uh, many years now right uh, priyank is someone who we've hosted on the podcast earlier as well uh so yeah great opportunity i mean they've increased the check size also mm-hmm. and they have a sort of a uh, sector or sort of trend focus towards bharat okay. startups uh, this time so yeah definitely check out the link we'll uh, put that in the description um and uh, refer your friends and uh, who knows you know they might yeah. be a part of the next uh, accelerator no, program startup operator <laughs> <laughs> okay some uh, good fundraisers from the week as well Uh, EdTech Unicorn Physics Wala raised 210 million dollars from Hornbill Capital and Lightspeed wow. Venture Partners. 210 is it? 210 million dollars. Wow. 
that just uh, brings this back memories of 2021 actually <laughs> yeah. i was just saying right there's money enough money in the ecosystem look edtech has pretty much properly. been cleaned up right right now i mean who's there in edtech uh, supposedly an academy is having problems byju has filed for bankruptcy right. uh, then upgrade you have is doing uh, silently well upgrade is yeah exactly you have a few others right that's about it i mean uh, so so there's definitely going to be some investments here uh and physics wala is interesting you know i mean uh, uh, they are not growing through acquisitions the way byju's uh, right. plan to right i mean <laughs> you remember 2021 where we were doing week one there was like yeah one acquisition. acquisition a month right hmm. there were 11 large acquisitions in 12 months i think oh. right uh, another <laughs> another round up and another byju's acquisition <laughs> but uh, physics wala is um, planning to grow a little more organically uh, right and uh, yeah wish them luck yeah. of course i mean uh, he was in the news as well right uh, it's for the neat scam. yeah for the neat scam as well yeah, yeah. i mean not that he <laughs> did the neat scam but no but he, he, he has emerged the, as a strong voice for uh, yeah for the students for what education in india yeah. could be like yeah. right so yeah. that's great then we have health tech startup redcliff labs that is 42 million dollars from ifu leapfrog investments health quad and spark growth ventures redcliff is a Runs a uh, di- diagnostics chain in India. What is that again? <laughs> <laughs> diagnostic chains in India. Di- diagnostics or diagnostic? Diagnostic. <laughs> okay. Anyway, then we have Everest Fleet, uh, which is a fleet management company. They raised three fifty one point seven crore rupees, or around thirty million dollars, from Uber. defense sector startup we also have hyperlocal new startup way to news that is 14 million dollars from westbridge capital and sashi reddy in short tech startup on surety raised 45 million from creages international finance corporation kona capital and nexus venture partners and last but not the least from the defense sector we have big bang boom that raised 250 crores or 30 million dollars from mumbai angel network vyom family office sbi s square investing and others interesting name huh <laughs> Talk yeah. about being on brand. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> I mean, bang, boom. <laughs> genius name for sure. Uh, speaking of, I mean, we might actually be speaking to the good folks at SSS uh, Defense, Who right? SSS they Defense? they manufacture these like rifles Ooh. and whatnot. Nice. Pretty cool. I think we might film them uh, in their factory. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. When is that happening? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> still still in the works, right? Okay. But. Uh, that could be awesome i mean you could see some big bang boom <laughs> on the podcast okay let's move on to the talk of the town section last week elliot hill was named the ceo of nike and twitter linkedin especially linkedin and mm. it was a buzz with uh, elliot's rise to uh, the ceo position 17 or 19 years back he started as a intern in nike under the wow. sales channel from there like almost every 2 or 3 years he was promoted to the next level he then went on to lead the regional sales team for a particular product and from there he made his way up to become the ceo on october 14th amazing what a stellar journey yeah a lot of these large companies right have these kind of career paths for people you know people who started on the shop floor uh, i can remember perhaps g uh, right uh, uh, nike as you mentioned right now uh, which is pretty amazing right i mean uh, knowing that uh, Hey, uh, I am the lowest of the rung here, yeah. and someday, I mean, I have a shot at the uh, at being the CEO. That's a fantastic motivator for sure, mm-hmm. right? Um, yeah, I, I was also listening to Professor Ashwat Damodaran on a different podcast, and it was interesting. He was saying that every company has a shelf life, per se, mm-hmm. right? And uh, once they've kind of lived through their utility, they should just like wind up, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, not really try to do all these crazy things. Uh, Uh, to stay young i mean he was uh, uh, he was also giving this example of uh, flipkart i mean what is that walmart acquiring flipkart he called it the most expensive facelift in the world <laughs> for 21 billion or whatever um interesting concept for sure right mm. uh, no it's also cool let's see like even mm. on the senior position right the usual trend is you hire someone senior and do it but that senior person will either be relying on his experience from a previous company or relying on data See, i do believe i do believe there are product companies like i don't know nike even boeing uh intel and so on right where 
you just need someone with that product dna you can't Correct, have yeah. like a typical you know financial controller's mindset cfo mindset in terms of okay you know assets and liabilities and like return on capital the best example i can think of is apple look at the various motions that went on in apple when yeah. john scully became the ceo yeah uh, that and uh, boeing right now what they're going through right where they have their first uh, non engineer ceo i think uh, right and some would say intel as well although intel the guy has been at the company for god knows how long hmm. uh, right but uh, you know there, there's a product thinking dna which has to be baked into whoever is at the helm you know um there's this wonderful wonderful article i was reading about how uh, you know uh, the typical managerial class kind of ruins companies uh, mm-hmm. we'll link to that um, uh, in the mindset. description you need some amount of that product mindset at least if not a founder's mindset right because you know at a certain scale you might just think of uh, you know a company as just uh, raking in profits and your job is to kind of optimize cash flows mm-hmm. but that's not it Right? Kind of I mean, operate as a PE firm. Yeah, uh, you you other. still have to make something valuable enough for people, right? And people's tastes are discerning, right? Technology is changing fast as ever, so you have to think ahead. You have to think mm-hmm. ahead. You have to invest in R and D. You have to have that product mindset. So so yeah, yeah, it's good. We also came across an interesting uh, Twitter thread by Kyle Chan, who talks about the collapse of new startups in China. Since two thousand eight to two thousand eighteen, there was almost a five x increase in the number of startups every year. But since twenty eighteen till date, that number has gone way below the five hundred or thousand level mark. And this is quite concerning, right? Because the growth story in China is quite comparable to the growth story in India. And I'm sure, as a country, we should be taking away key lessons from how the Chinese ecosystem has evolved. The point uh, Kyle is also trying to make is that the definition of what constitutes a startup has kind of changed in the last like few years, and which is why you see the uh, difference in numbers. But that aside, no one can deny that there's been a massive implosion of uh, the startup ecosystem over a couple of years or so, right? Starting mm-hmm. with the tech companies, then gaming, and so on. Uh, no one can deny that. And uh, <laughs> there have been some overtures by uh, the Chinese politicians. Uh, you know uh, with uh, Pre- president uh, xi visiting uh, sf as well uh, recently right uh, and um, you know trying to attract capital so look i mean i think this is uh, uh, it, so if there's something that we have to take away from this it is that you know there is this massive opportunity capital is seeking new uh, venues to sort of like grow and uh, we can definitely attract this capital right which is what i think all the uh, investors and founders here have been like trying to do uh right and uh, i i don't see like a chinese style like a ban or a, a, you know complete uh, extermination of uh, startups uh, hmm. being spearheaded by the government right i mean in fact i mean it's the opposite um if you listen to any of uh, prime minister modi's speeches there's always this emphasis of startups right um and uh, you know increasing uh, like the increasing the ease of uh, doing business and so on Uh, to what degree they've succeeded i mean well you guys you guys can uh, mm. see that over the last like 4 or 5 years um, right but uh, yeah i mean that's the single biggest lesson i feel like which is to encourage startup ecosystem and make sure that there's enough capital here uh, enough and more that we attract so that it grows yeah. so as listening to this very interesting interview of dr pramod verma he was one of the persons behind the upi gst aadhar um, development in india and he said for any technology to flourish in a, at a country level there are three things that need to come together one is the policy and the regulations one is the technology in itself the infrastructure and third is the innovation ecosystem which is people building the technology to drive more products and utility but this needs to be supported by the policy reform by the regulatory reforms yeah. if either of these three goes out of balance that might not be as successful a deployment i think what went on in china is that the policy just decided to take control over anything like make it very stringent you have to yeah. ally with the communist party and what not i mean the communist party is literally like a like a sleeping partner in all of these businesses of any scale there right mm-hmm. i mean so it's it's quite different uh people somehow uh, <laughs> make this uh, joke about uh, you know uh, nirmala sitaraman ji being the you know sleeping partner in their businesses because of the amount of taxes uh, she charges <laughs> and what not but 
you know it is what it is right mm-hmm. so yeah so so there was this video doing the rounds which includes a old mm-hmm. news clip of rajiv bajaj who is the ceo of bajaj auto he was asked about should you know super bikes and sports bikes go electric take a look at that snippet field has already declared it's in public domain that they will be launching an electric motorcycle ultraviolet revolt have electric motorcycles in the market ola plans to launch them as well now considering that the market is going to come up with these electric motorcycles uh, what is your thought on uh, bringing one to market so the short story is that as a company we strongly believe Uh, that uh, uh, you know while scooters and motorcycles with both be popular uh, scooters in the electric format uh, hold far greater potential than do motorcycles that's why you know there is nothing ultra about the sale of ultra violet also brand right and what it stood for uh, for a while in terms of performance motorcycling in india uh, but i mean w- where is that spirit uh, now we are conceding you know beyond a certain tier of power band we are conceding that um, mantle to the european or the japanese companies right and right we okay. come from a different school of thought we believe that the future of what india can do um, definitely can put us in pole position when it comes to performance tech in the world of motorsports included right in fact why don't we make it a little interesting sure sure absolutely um, we're going to be there right in the backyards of uh, bajaj auto at um, a race format event in about 90 days time at ambi valley wow fantastic and we okay. are bringing the best of what we've got absolutely right, in terms of design tech performance coming together right and uh, we definitely invite uh, bajaj auto to bring the best of what they've got right and i think a simple race format should probably give the answers to who's really really wow. with limited resources and capital who's really pushing the boundaries of what indian engineering can truly achieve so over there what i was referring to was this company called ultraviolet which whose founders you have had in the podcast back in 2020 i think yeah they building some kick ass electric sports bike this is this is great this is like a our own indian version <laughs> in the two wheeler space of ford versus ferrari coming up to ultraviolet versus bajaj auto amazing amazing and credit to uh, narayan as well right i mean he is being so gracious hmm. uh mr bajaj has been <laughs> well lesser said the better i mean earlier he said he's going to eat oats for breakfast oh. saying that he's going to eat ola ether and whoever else in the evs uh, segment for <laughs> breakfast uh right and, and now this very flippant remark that ultra there's nothing hmm. ultra about ultraviolet uh look the ultraviolet tech is astounding yeah. okay i mean they've literally reinvented every damn thing on that bike uh right when it could have been like very prudent for them to just like import stuff put a label and sell it hmm. right so ultraviolet is absolute true in innovation uh they still don't have the distribution like your hero and tvs and what not maybe they will someday and also they're playing a niche category right i mean they're playing this whole super bike category and the thing is that you know friend of mine has the bike and the few others that uh, i've spoken to who have you know ridden the bike right i mean they swear by it Oh. right they absolutely swear by it and they say it's a piece of art uh, right so that's the kind of stuff we need man i mean uh, and he's right he's absolutely right you know bajaj pulsar when it first came out it was such a it was, it was a, a brilliant bike. brilliant bike yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and where is the spirit now you know we don't have that as much mm. uh, right so amazing amazing so i am reminded of that uh, that quote right i think it's often attributed to mohandas gandhi um you know first they ignore you then they laugh at you then they fight you and then you win you know <laughs> I, i i think some function of that is going to happen here as well so hey google uh, q big dogs <laughs> <laughs> so all the best to the ultraviolet team i mean of course we are rooting for you guys um yeah make it happen yeah uh ether energy is also trending in twitter this was during the onam <laughs> <laughs> celebration <laughs> someone actually posted a picture of the banana leaf with some curries in it and some a chapati on that plate now yes of course chapati is not a you know a very expected delicacy in south india no no it's not just that But see come on stop getting outraged by it no no is. it is an outrage see the thing is that you don't realize how much of an emotional bond that boiled rice has <laughs> with with malayalis right uh-huh. i mean it's just like it's such a very very emotional feeling Mm. you know and uh, onam sadhya i mean without that rice is is unimaginable to uh, most people 
agree yeah. but there was rice not that there wasn't rice yeah I mean, people outright yeah, about all kinds of stuff but i am just saying like that's uh-huh. the significance so they they uh, released a <laughs> wait the pr team at ethar man these guys are doing a a1 job they <laughs> posted on twitter saying ki there has been reports of this particular lunch served at one of our offices re- recently where chapati was seen on a banana leaf our teams have looked at the photo and identified the root cause blah 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 uh then they end the letter by saying this was a rare lapse of judgment on our end and have since conducted numerous cultural sensitivity workshops to prevent any such occurrence great it was signed off by with love 135 malayalis at either <laughs> dude what a burn man like what a burn yeah yeah no they they took it very well they took it sportingly mm. um I, i mean it's a it's a lesson in uh, pr for sure yeah, yeah. So we also have uh, sort of Nitra Walker back on back on the trending list in Twitter. Here's a look at the video. And we got the results against the top team. So it's also been quite the year for your work here at Oracle too. You're not just a US cricket star, you are also an employee here at Oracle. So tell us a little bit about your work with Database 23 AI. I think 23 AI is really exciting. I'm getting to work on the AI vector search a project which is the next gen for our our database a product and uh, yeah it's really cool to work on the cutting edge of technology seeing that large language models have matured so much over, over the years and it's great to be now integrated in our converged Yeah. Uh, our DB model. Yeah, it's awesome. I I got to ask though. How do you have time for both jobs? <laughs> That's my big question too. I how do you do it? Most importantly, it's the love for it. I'm passionate about tech and I'm passionate about the sport. So, as long as it's you passionate about it doesn't seem like work. You love doing it. You just have to find the time to do it and compartmentalize. You switch on and switch off. do 100% what you're do- doing at that moment of time that's good that's good advice in life actually yeah. <laughs> I'll, i'll try to ha- remember that yeah. one the um, last year we talked a lot about vector database um, but i think it might be good like a quick refresher and then tell us what a hybrid vector index is what a guy man what a guy i mean it's the typical uh, like sharma ji ka beta uh-huh. right i mean like engineer filing patents working on automation ai and what not mm-hmm. right and then this is I mean, also proving proving indian parents right and ha theek hai aapko acting karna hai sports khelna hai khelo naukri bhi karo engineer bano pehle engineering bano i mean <laughs> amazing amazing uh oracle man i mean what a company dude i mean i, I think you know people may come and go but i have a feeling oracle will stay on forever <laughs> <laughs> you know I, i i mean larry ellison wants to stay on forever mm-hmm. right he has funded some 500 million dollars in longevity research anti aging and what not but oracle for sure right i mean it's uh, it's like that um, uh what do you what do you call that i mean it's like the landlord of b2b saas basically <laughs> right irrespective of what you do who you are i don't care i mean you're going to give me 10 or 15% yeah. uh, there is oracle amazing. there is sap these guys will forever be there yeah uh, i mean and larry 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 what a guy man i mean he's uh, he he's 80 years old but it won't seem like it i mean if you looked at him he probably looks like a 60s guy right um amazing is he man. doing some like blood transfusion with a younger who person? knows <laughs> who knows i mean he's chairman and cto and uh, yeah he's 80 years old Uh, he became the second richest uh, person in the world i think he's worth about 190 billion dollars or something oh. yeah so <laughs> amazing life goals larry if you're listening to this please reach out <laughs> party <laughs> for becoming the second <laughs> richest <laughs> person <laughs> but one can only hope for right to to Why not? get them yeah we we couldn't convince the folks at misho and flipkart <laughs> to like give us a party right larry ellison is going to fly down <laughs> Okay guys I think that's a great note to wrap up this discussion we had really cool announcements right again from e-commerce the government taking part in startup building and some exciting fundraisers uh thanks for staying with us right till this end we ha- we hope that you have some really interesting takeaways from this conversation as well uh once again do all the good stuff like share comment and read this uh, podcast on your favorite platform we'll be back again in 2 weeks time Yeah, hopefully. So I think this uh, this fortnightly cycle kind of works, right? What do you guys think? I mean, 
there's just a lot more to discuss more depth more nuance uh, all the good stuff that you like anyway uh, by the way if you haven't checked out the fantastic uh, discussion we had with shashank uh, of alive health uh, that has been live for a few days now and uh, yeah has been getting good response uh, it's a deep dive on the health insurance landscape in india and uh, uh, alive has been doing some fantastic work uh, next up we will be publishing uh, an episode with the founders of infinite club joy and ankita uh, joy i know from uh, about 15 years now and uh, uh, they're doing some amazing stuff unlocking value from uh, uh, the esops and and enabling uh, you know a wider set of people to kind of invest in startups as well so do check out that episode without fail and let us know if uh, there's a interesting founder that we should host on the podcast uh, happy to host them and uh, yeah and also tell so us like what kind of content we should be coming in we are trying to experiment with different formats of content as well yeah uh, so any suggestions on that front also is really welcome all of that yeah let us know what you think about my show <laughs> <laughs> all right guys we'll let you go have a great week ahead and we'll see you again soon bye 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 cheers <laughs>